Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, th thanks for turning up so early. Um, yes, it, it, I do have to have a word with the DebConf organizers. They do seem to like scheduling the Reese talk the first thing in the morning, and always after the cheese and wine party, which is... Uh, it's, so I, I am quite glad to see so many bodies here. Perhaps everyone's not very awake and there's not many minds, but at, at least you're here. So this is the traditional talk from the uh, release team. Um, I, I do want to say at the start that um, we're not going to announce that we're frozen already. I know it is traditional to have some sort of, of, of big show, but uh, hopefully we've, we, we've got a few bits and pieces that, uh, that sort of show what we're doing and, and how we're going to make um, Squeeze a great release. So the um, first piece, I'm going to sort of split this into two parts. The first bit of work um, that I wanted to do after we released is have a, a retrospective. Um, this was really so we could get the idea of what worked and what didn't. Um, we're certainly not perfect, um, and there's lots of changes that, um, we, that need to be made every release. It is a bit of an iterative process, um, and we wanted to gather the views of, of what people um, thought went well. So we went on a sprint um, over um, to Belgium, and I do want to say thanks to, to, to the sponsors. So we also had um, Debbie in there um, who paid for the uh, travel and accommodation. And then we had Inuits who paid for the um, venue itself. And obviously we gathered quite a, a, a number of, of different points. So uh, we got, after some prodding, quite a few emails in. I do have to say there were quite a few good and bad points in there. Um, and they were remarkably, actually, once we totted them all up, they were about the same. So people thought, people did generally give us things that went well and things that didn't go well. And firstly, on the, the sort of good points we had, I think we had a, a these were sort of prime areas that, that people picked up. Firstly, we had a, a very high quality release. Um, we managed to produce a release that we really can be proud of. Um, we had the quality that Debian is famous for. Um, an example of this is one user um, responded, said that their Wi-Fi card worked with Debian and it didn't work with any other distribution they had tried. And I know that's quite odd given, given our position on firmware, but it can show that we actually do produce something that, that is stable and, and that has a high level of quality. Another one was the BTS usage, so the um, tag handling. Developers seem to like the use of the BTS for triaging requests to the release team and to get an overview of potential removals or states of packages. Um, third, um, unblock handling. Um, generally, um, although there are, of course, exceptions, people were happy with the amount of time and the flexibility that the release team gave into handling unblock requests. Um, communications were improved, um, although there is obviously more to be done in this area. And the length of time um, between releases was picked up by a number of developers. It was fairly clear that developers were happy with the sort of timeliness of the release itself. And that's not the freeze necessarily, as everyone al always wants a shorter freeze, um, but the actual sort of two year in between different, um, in between the two releases um, seemed to go quite well. So next we have the bad, or the not-so-good point, shall we say. Um, and one of the main ones that was brought up here was the communication at um, DebConf9 in Spain around time-based freezes. Um, now, a lot of people have commented on this before and past, and at also uh, the freeze announcements at DebConf10. Um, and we recognize that we didn't do it as well as we should have. It was a mistake, and hopefully with um, some of the ideas and clarities that we're going to have, um, which, which we're all about to hear, um, this will make it easier for everyone to know what's going on. Um, freeze duration, yes, everyone doesn't like uh, long freezes. Um, lack of clarity and process policy. People didn't really know um, how, what, what sort of uh, reasonable um, requests would be for, for unblocks. So they did like the, the, the way we were very flexible with um, applying what rules we had, but they didn't like that they didn't know what the rules were. Um, so hopefully that will um, be, be addressed as well. And um, 
one that came up quite a bit from within the team itself, because I also asked them about what we should be doing, is um, manpower. We have a limited number of people, and especially around freeze release times, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so that was definitely an issue. Um, and when coming up with a, a sort of solution for, for how we're going to do this, um, that there's sort of a principle that I, I really want to apply to the uh, release team and release process, um, which is one based around... Sorry. No surprises. And the idea is that people should simply not be surprised that we're about to freeze. They should not be surprised that their package is about to be removed or that it's going into testing or that there's a problem. And that information should be there. And, and one of the criticisms we've had in the past is our process of removing things from testing. Um, so this is something we're going to try. Um, we're going to create a tool that finds likely candidates. Um, for removals for testing, and we're going to use that in a semi-automated way. Um, in fact, very much like we do at the moment. Um, but at the moment, we have a, have a list of things, and we go manually searching for things to remove, or people come and find us. And um, one of the important things is that this can be used for the manual removals when we notice there's a problem, and for the automatic ones. And they will mail Debian Devel in advance and say, on this date, this package will be removed for this reason, unless someone comes and tells us why it shouldn't be, or the bug gets fixed, etc. So it's very much about providing that transparency so everyone knows where they are and where they stand, and um, what's going to happen in advance. Um, so, th so again, these are the problems, and, and I'm going to address them in sort of bottom-up order, because the, uh, that's the easiest to sort of talk about. Firstly, you have, so we also want solutions as well as, as the problems, and so we've been thinking about this. In terms of manpower, um, there's a number of things. We have the role of the RMs um, can basically split into sort of dovetailing into what Zach, um, um, what Stefano was saying in, in his talk. Um, we tried it a little bit in the last release, and it worked quite well. So we're going to have sort of two um, sides to the RMs. You have Adam at the front, um, who will be certainly leading on the technical side of getting things fixed, making sure the bugs in, in, in testing stay there. And I'll be dealing with a lot more the in, sort of management or uh, side of release management, the administrative side. So it's, it's things like making sure bits mails get out, everyone uh, knows that documentation's there, and, and sort of the project really knows um, what we're doing. Second one is uh, sort of a better tracking of distribution of ongoing work. Uh, we are looking at tools and, and various information on how we can um, enable the project to see what's happening. Um, and we would like to get more involvement or possibly a delegation of people who aren't currently in the release team. We do want to open that up a lot more. Because as the number of packages increase, um, then the amount of work for the release team um, increases, and it's not getting any bigger. So we need to find some way of reducing that amount of work or getting more people involved. So I'm keen to make sure we try and do that. And uh, the last one is um, more people. This is certainly all, always useful. Um, and there has been a couple of changes recently in, in the release team. Um, we've had to say goodbye, but thank you very much to Pierre who's uh, been working really hard on the release team, so I do want to take this opportunity to thank him. And a welcome to Niels, who should be around somewhere. He did, there he is, so he, he's, he's our new release assistant. Um, <laughs> and, and Neil has also been volunteered or, or accepted to do quite a, a very important job with the above, which is basically to write a lot of documentation. Um, he was asking um, why there wasn't any documentation on this or on that, and we said it didn't exist. Um, so we suggested that as he goes along this process of finding out how to be a release assistant and, and working out the policies, that he might want to document it at the same time. And his response was, hmm. Now, that wasn't no. And if you, say, if you don't say no clearly, then you end up with this. So, so for the next couple of years, I think, maybe, may, maybe a little bit less, there, then there will be a lot of documentation produced. 
I'm going to deal with these top three problems because all together, the, these are all to do with, with freezing. Um, and there, there's been a number of discussions on the mailing list about how we freeze. Um, so let's have a quick look. And this is sort of how we pick a freeze date in the release team. There's, there's been a number of methods tried in the past, um, and they all seem to lead to fairly long freezes. Um, certainly in the case of, um, uh, in the past, it's been a couple of years, but uh, normally about six months, and people find this is, is too long for, for various reasons. So firstly, you can pick the number of RC bugs. You can say, at this level of RC bugs, we will freeze. Um, and it's a fairly uh, interesting metric um, because sometimes the uh, number of RC bugs never really gets down to that level. The second one is um, when the RC bug rate flatlines, so you're waiting, so the RC bug rate is coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down, and eventually it sort of reaches a plateau. And it doesn't get any better because there's new RC bugs being introduced at the same rate as old ones being fixed. At that point, it can be a useful point to freeze and to say, okay, now we're going to not uh, do any, I mean, now we're not going to um, introduce any new RC bugs, we're going to keep where we are. And the, the third possible way we're doing it is when things are ready. So you have KD or GNOME or the kernel, um, hopefully they're eventually going to be ready and we'll be able to um, freeze that. But that also isn't very satisfactory because um, the chances of the kernel and KD and GNOME all being ready at the same time can be quite uh, interesting. So something that has been suggested on the mailing lists is time-based freezes. And this is the idea that you uh, freeze at a set month and set time and um, hang the consequences. And the advantage of this is it really helps everyone understand that this is what's going on. So it goes back to this idea of no surprises. Everyone should know exactly the state of the release at all times. And we think it's good in theory. There are going to be a number of issues, I think, um, that we're going to have. And these are examples. So will things be ready? The kernel, for example. I see Phil giggling at the back. Um, <laughs> ah, right, OK. Um, so will the kernel be ready? Will DI be ready? Um, this is a traditional problem we've had in the past. <laughs> and, uh, excellent. And, and then what happens if we're not ready? So what happens if it gets to June 2012 and, and there's 2,000 RC bugs and everything's in a state that in flux? So again, solutions. Firstly, reminders. We want to tell the project every month what we're doing um, and we want to carry on saying this is what the state is, this is when the freeze is going to happen and, and we want to really try and get the project involved in trying to make sure that they know exactly what's going on at all times. Secondly, more use of the BTS um, tags. Um, people liked them before, so why not start using them immediately? Why not use them when we're not frozen? Um, and then everyone gets the idea of, of what's going on. And also, people can help contribute as well, so it doesn't just have to be the release team that, that um, flags up um, candidates for removals or transitions, and everyone else can help with that. And the third one, described as suck it and see. We're going to try it for one release. Um, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But um, we're certainly very happy to try anything. Um, and that does, I, I do need to just bring on this other point which we've been pestered for for quite some time, which is um, cut or uh, rolling or testing or bob or whatever it happens to be called this week. Um, this idea that um, that there should be something different to testing. Um, I first want to just have a look at what testing is for. And now, originally, when AJ set it up, we, I think, managed to dig through and find the original mails. And, and the idea is that it just should exist to make stable releases easier. It should be a tool of the release team, and, uh, and nothing else matters. Now, obviously, we've, we've, we've moved on slightly from that. We're, we're not in that position. We have users. And um, it is in itself a very useful tool. It's a great way of providing um, testing for the stable release, of having an area that, that is not um, unstable and has some sort of uh, level of um, stability there, but isn't 
a full stable release, and, and people do, do like that. Um, now, there is a question of, um, can this be unbroken at all times? And not easily possible, um, is the answer. There are times when the release team will break testing. Um, an example of this is when the Perl um, 5.12 um, transition got tied into the um, eglibc transition, which created thousands and thousands of packages that all had to go migrate into testing uh, first. And so what we did is we broke um, libsvn, but only on k3bsd. And that allowed this transition to all go through, and we forced it through. And it's important to say that when we break something in testing, um, we clean it up afterwards. So it's not something that we just break it and then leave it, and, and then there's a, a horrible thing. Whenever we use a force int and whenever we, we, we force things through into testing, we make sure that um, we know, we track the state and we know what's going on. Because we really do care about testing, because it's the next table release. But perhaps the emphasis is, is slightly different on, on, uh, on, on how we care about testing. So it has been mentioned that we could use cut or rolling. And basically, our position is there. We don't mind. If people want to put the work in, excellent. That's, that's fine by us. But it shouldn't impact um, the stable release process. For us in the release team, our perspective is this is what we, we as a project are trying to do. Um, and we're trying to get a stable release out. So if it essentially doesn't mean more work for the, stable, for the release team, then, then that's absolutely fine. Um, and this includes asking the release team to do some work. Um, now, there's some values of work. Of course, we're always happy to answer questions and give support to anyone who wants. But getting the release team to do vast swathes of work is something that, um, as much as we'd like to, we just don't have the time for. Um, we, we, there's not that many people in the release team. And I should point out, if you are interested in, in coming along and being a member of the release team, we'd, we'd be, of course, happy to have you. Um, so the idea behind rolling sort of came about um, because there was a feeling that uh, during freezes, th there wasn't enough development and there wasn't enough uh, sort of excitement, new development happening. And the entire project started focusing. Um, now, instead of um, essentially releasing a, a, a new, rebootstrapping a new suite and doing things a whole new way, we'd like to take something that, that's a little bit easier, more straightforward, and can be accomplished in in a lot uh, smaller time frames. And this, the idea is basically, experimental should be easier. And it should be easier to, to develop with. And there's a couple of things we've got coming up. Uh, the automatic moving of packages from experimental to unstable, thanks to our FTP masters here. Um, we, we've asked that there is some sort of tool or a suite that um, allows you to say, OK, I've uploaded my packages to experimental and they're tested, and everyone's happy now. Now, perform this action which moves all of that into unstable, avoids unnecessary rebuilds, and so it doesn't hit the building network. And it's just a very easy way of saying, that should now go in experimental. So you don't have to re-upload, and then wait for a deinstall, and then wait for all the rebuilds to happen, and, and then, f and then f uh, have a look at that. You can just very easily use experimental. And the second one is on-demand experimental repositories. Um, this is a slightly longer-term goal. Um, I, I think Mark said the first one he can do within a week or so. Um, but the second one is going to be slightly longer. Um, and this is the idea that you can have your own experimental, a bit like a sort of PPA. Um, if you want to, say, start to work on a transition or work on a large change, you can get your own experimental area that, that you can have and that disappears once you're done with it. And this is the idea so you can work on anything you want, even when um, unstable is frozen. And then we have to look at the, the sort of second reason that experimental isn't used as much. It needs to be easier to use, so easier to explore. People should be able to see uh, what's in experimental. They should be able to very easily pick things out. And um, again, we have this um, second idea, which is the experimental changes mailing list. Uh, we currently have like the testing changes, so people can subscribe to it and see what new things are coming into experimental, and really try and help raise the profile of, it, of its use. But um, there's also a bit of a question mark. Um, 
one thing, I, I don't know, obviously, why people don't use experimental, otherwise we would have fixed it a long time ago. So we really, obviously, welcome any ideas on, on how we can improve that. And if we, there's, there's always ideas about how, how we make unstable still usable during freeze times and inserting different levels of sweets. And I, my view is that there's always been one. We've had the experimental suite. It's always existed. People should use it. But I'm, I'm very interested in finding out why people don't use it. And I've deliberately um, left this quite short, so we've got about 25-odd minutes for, um, for questions. Um, and I really do want to hear people's thoughts on, on what we're doing with the release, um, what, what sort of principles we should, and, and how we can do things like make experimental more exciting. So I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to the floor if anyone has any questions. So, you hear me? Um, yeah. Try that. Should be working. Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, one question or uh, suggestion about the uh, transparency of no surprises thing. Uh, it would be cool if, uh, for example, the popularity contents or some package like that, uh, if you have uh, some set of packages installed in your current stable and the new stable is coming soon, so you get uh, notifications if any of that packages are going to be removed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you depend on some package which is in current stable but will be removed in the next, so you get some notification, I don't know, it returns output via your cron job or something, so you can get notified and maybe you can then act something, look at the bug, maybe fix it, suggest something or whatever. Yeah, um, certainly when we're looking at the how we're going to do removals um, from testing, we can probably do something machine readable um, as, as well as normal so people can have a look and examine what they've got and see if they've got that package installed. That, that certainly shouldn't be a problem. Um, I, I, th I think that was. I think I heard you just there volunteering to write it as well, wasn't that? So, um, so, so that that will certainly be be useful. And and a lot of, again, it's it's about adding work to the reason. We do want to do things that make things easier for us and for the project as a whole. Um, so, so it's certainly something that I think w would be useful. Any more questions? So, a uh, comment on why don't I use experimental more? Um, and so this is either a technical problem with me or with the uh, build demons, is that picking up dependencies from experimental, so if you have a, you have a package, you want to put in experimental, but it depends on some libraries and those are in experimental, that doesn't seem to work unless you have version dependencies on the libraries, which you don't necessarily want to do, I mean, in general, just to make the experimental build work. Yep. So that's maybe a minor technical issue, or maybe I need a clue, uh, but that's, my, my, that's been my experience, is then it's been troublesome to get, get things to, complex things to build in experimental. Well, I think we've probably got some build people or FTP masters around here that, that should be able to, to talk about that. Um, I've got a spare microphone we can get at the front here, or actually here's one. Is this on? Yeah. So actually what you can do for... Oh, sorry. So what you can actually do now on the Wonderbuild side is do temporary dependencies or build dependencies for packages that are actually added during the build. So you don't have to get everything right in theory, but at least for bin and MUs into experimental, you could specify that it should pick something else from experimental to make it easier. But that hasn't been communicated in a good way yet, but will hopefully be soon. Yes, uh, again, it's there's a lot of this is going to be useful documentation, which I'm sure will be produced any day now. Um, 
looking hopefully towards the back. Um, and yeah, so, so, so that's certainly something we can help. Yeah, if, if you look to your left at the person sat there, that, then he'll tell you exactly how to do this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that's absolutely fine. At the front? Oh, first yeah. Yeah, I think for myself, I'm a lot more interested in, the, uh, in having some kind of uh, set of archives that I can use uh, rather than just experimental. Um, the, the main use of experimental that I make is uh, building versions from upstream trunk of uh, some important package or other. And uh, those are typically not directly suitable for promotion to unstable. Um, but I might also like to try out something that will be useful for promotion to unstable. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a lot more interested in the, I, rea I realize, more difficult, uh, larger piece. Yeah, well, it's uh, certainly more difficult for the FTP masters. It's, it's, it's fairly straightforward for us, I believe, um, because we don't need to worry about it. Um, I want to know what, how you made your slides, because I find they're amazing. <laughs> um, this one is a website called Prezi.com. It's not free software. Um, and if anyone wants... To, and and I, I was tempted to start a boff on, on why um, free software doesn't work for UK government. Um, but that, that's probably a, another question. Um, that, as a hint, it was very much hindered by um, Oracle's purchase of Sun and what that did to the rate of development of OpenOffice. Um, and I, I see, see Tom raising his hand there. I, I'm not sure in, in defense or in attack of, of this proposal. Oh, oh, it's actually not a, not a comment on uh, OpenOffice or LibreOffice at all. but, but um, <laughs> One can make a presentation like this with free software with a tool called Jesse Inc., which is basically on top of Inkscape. And uh, so you could have the same effect. It's really quite fun. Um, it's J E S S Y I N K, I believe. And yeah, I'll send an email with a link. That would be easier. <laughs> you need a pretty good CPU to do that with uh, SVG. It's SVG, and so you zoom in and zoom out. But that's a lot of fun. Can we? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, there's a question about it. Can it be made a, a, a accessible as well? And um, I don't know, but that is a. It's an excellent, excellent issue for us. I think to always think about uh, accessibility. So the question was, um, do we have any update on, on when we should expect a, a, a Lenny point release? I, I assume Steve is asking because he's trying to plan his, 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 um, his thing. I, I think the 10th of September might, might be a good weekend. Um, <laughs> I, I point that out because that's when Steve is getting married. So I, I think, I, 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 uh, along with Joe, his, his lovely fiance. So, so I, I think if, if we make sure that, that in between the, in the vows, he, he he just types a quick make CD release uh, and pushes that out. But I, I'm not sure I'll be the most popular person at the wedding, but, but, but that should be, currently be. Um, any idea from our SRMs at the front when we have an next point release? Nope, they're shaking their heads. So I think the answer to your question is no. It, it's on the to-do list, so hopefully we should be able to do that. Um, while I'm on that, we, what we had is the etch and a half in previous years, and we are looking at... Um, not necessarily doing another one, because if we have, I think, a fairly two-year sort of um, lifespan, then, then A, that's a lot shorter than it has in the par past. But we, we are looking again at our policies on what we do with things like um, graphics drivers, um, network updates, things to support new hardware, and, and what we're going to do around supporting those in stable. Um, I'm, because I am keen to try and make sure that stable remains usable for, for as long as it can do. Um, well, and as far as I understood, um, Ben asked for um, testing for a network 
um, drivers to the next um, stable kernel. So um, he backported some of the network drivers and probably, uh, and as far as I saw it, got no response from anyone to that. So there is some backporting of network drivers to the current stable kernel. There's someone at the back. Um, yeah, so um, there is, I think there is going to be a, a bit of a change to how we've traditionally um, done things. Th this is the, there was a, a great talk which um, Joey Hess was thinking about called the balkanization of Debian. And this is the idea that um, the bulk, the impression of the Balkans has been um, in the past not great. And that's changing a lot. So there is a lot of great things happening here. And it isn't a, a war-torn country. Um, it's, it's really quite, quite beautiful. And um, there is the impression of Debian that we, A, have flame wars all the time on the mailing lists. Um, and that um, stable releases are old and out of date. And we do need to change that. We don't have huge, apart from system D, huge flame wars on the mailing lists anymore. Um, if we have a look at the amount of GRs that we had, that, that's really gone down quite a lot. If we have a look at the last DPL election, um, there was one candidate. So we don't have this very divisive thing that we used to. And um, stable releases are coming out now every two years fairly regularly. And um, we also want to try and challenge the way that people say stable releases are old and out of date. Um, returning, to the, returning to the question of um, updated hardware drivers, the, Stand up. the previous um, point update already had backported drivers for a few, um, for the E1000E and the Brocade driver and some HP storage stuff. But there are still three um, backports from network drivers which need testers. So if any one of you has one of these updated hardware, um, um, it's documented in bugs against the kernel package, um, all the testing stuff you need to do when you run this. And once you report back to test results, this can be added to the next 603 point update. So these are things that are already happening. We are already seeing um, new, new hardware being supported in stable releases. Um, I think someone next to you, was it? Oh. Yeah, um, if you would like to make a call to test newer kernel drivers or whatever, just ask the publicity team and we can end or mention it in the Debian project news. And a question at the front I think we had. Um, do you have made any plans to support the new kernel versioning for stable so that one can use newer kernels? Um, with, I think within our current stable release, obviously I'm not, the sta I'm, I'm not involved with the stable releases. That's Adam at the front who I'm, I'm going to um, pick on or, or Phil who is studiously ignoring the microphone that's being offered to him very well. Um, so, so, so is there plans to introduce new kernels, basically, or use concurrent versioning so we can have within stable releases, or support that? As far as, as, far as I know, there aren't any plans to do that, except from like suggesting that there are kernels and backports and maybe fixing up stuff in stable so that you can actually boot with like 3.0 kernels. Yeah, so, so, so there is some that we, that we can look at there. Um, yep, yeah. yeah. anyone have any else that they want to raise? Um, I was just wondering, uh, the timing of the proposed release uh, seems kind of right, maybe before DebCom for something. Was, like, what was the plan for why June 2012? Um, well, firstly, that, that, that's the timing for the proposed freeze rather than the proposed release. Um, we, we do still want to stick with releasing it when it's ready because that is a very important thing. It's almost what De Debian is famous for. We release when it's ready, not from any particular date. Um, on coming up with the, perhaps Adam may be able to, to chip in as well, but on coming up with the date for when we freeze the, the month, it took me two hours, two or three hours or something of discussions to try and work out um, this date. And, and we realized it's not a perfect date for everyone. Um, if we have it before um, DebConf, then obviously we're, we're frozen during um, DebConf. If we have it in 
um, afterwards, then we're hitting school holidays, or we're hitting Christmas, or, or some things just won't work. So we basically picked a, a date we thought was going to be reasonable, and we hoped would aim towards the about two years between releases that, that we were after. Um, and so hopefully we, we can then release slightly quicker than the two years, but um, if, if not, then, then we do have a little bit of time extra there. And it's something that, that we could try. Um, one of the issues we had that, that the project had with the previous proposal was, was how that um, syncs up with Ubuntu. And one of the views is that we were doing this to simply help Ubuntu. Um, having talked to um, Steve Langazak, he I, I'm very, very assured that this does not help Ubuntu in any way, shape, or form. He was, he was very, very clear that this is not a good date. Um, but um, that said, in the future, if this does work, and we want to, again, pick sort of... If, if this does work very well, then, then I'd be looking at doing something like June 2014 for the, for the next release and trying to regularize that, so again, everyone knows. And then other distributions can try and sync up with that. Um, Again, if it doesn't work in June, then we can try and change it. Um, but it's very much about making sure that everyone knows what's going on at all times. The front. So if somebody were so foolhardy as to respond to your call for more manpower on the team, uh, what would... Uh, what would you be looking for, for for them to do and what would they be getting themselves into in terms of a new member of the team? Yeah, N Niels is saying now quite documentation there. Now but, that um, Niels is on the team already. We've, we've already got a volunteer for that, so, so we don't need much there. Um, uh, the best thing to do is join the Debian release mailing list, if you, if you don't already. Read that. Um, try and find um, things called easy hints, sets of packages that depend on each other that have to go in. Hopefully that will be a, a, a slight easier problem in the future. We have something called Brittany 2 coming along, which is the tool that moves things from unstable into testing. And that has some auto-hinting capabilities that tries to work out packages that, that can go together. Um, and we also have a uh, SAT solver, um, which we hope to use to, again, provide for, for some of the slightly harder easy hints. Um, Easy hints are, are basically where we say that package and that package needs to go together, um, rather than preferring something over, over, over another one. So some of those harder situations, hopefully the SAT solver can help with. But th there's certainly a lot of stuff. Again, documentation is very useful. If you come and find, say, I don't know how that works, th then ask us, but then write it down. One of the things I did in my last bits mail was I um, said we need more documentation, and what do people want? Do people want FAQs? Do they need glossaries of the terms we're using? Do they want flowcharts? Uh, please tell us. And I got zero responses. So nobody fed back to feedback at release.debian.org um, as, as to what they want. What sort of documentation do, do people, would, would people find useful? Sort of an open question to the room. And I'm getting the same level of responses as I did to my mail, I see. Um, so, so People put their hand up if they think documentation about the release process would be useful. Right, so some people think that would be useful. So, ah, Niels has put his hand up as well, so, so that's probably very useful as well. Um, <laughs> as he'll be writing most of it. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's something we, we're keen to do so to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Um, so writing documentation, although it, it, it's, um, it co could be not the most exciting thing in the world, and, and uh, um, is, is something that, that, that's always useful to everyone. Anyone else? One at the front. I'm very excited by the idea of having a, a special experimental repository for uh, preparing transitions. Uh, but, well, as you said, it's not your business, mainly uh, FTP master, but it's not only FTP master, there's also a problem of uh, build daemons integration and much more than just uh, FTP masters. Do we uh, have some sort of coordinated plan already, or is it only uh, one or two FTP masters thinking aloud, uh, oh, yeah, that would be nice? It's not probably not directly for you, but maybe Mark can already answer. There is an email about to go to the Build D people before we send it out more publicly. So, yes, we're working on a plan, um, but we haven't finished it off yet. Um, 
so there is a proposal um, and I'm just being cautious because Phil's only sat slightly to my left and he doesn't know about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there's an email going to Build D fairly soon to talk to them about what would be necessary and then we'll send other project for more comments as a whole. And I'll also point out at Thursday at 10, apparently, that there's an FTP master boff. So if you're interested in anything to do with FTP master or DAC or something, then going on Thursday at 10, that's Thursday at 10. At 10 o'clock on Thursday, there's a boff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's Thursday, yeah. At 10 o'clock? Yeah, I just thought I'd mention, just in case anyone wasn't clear as, as, to, as to what we got there. Uh, so, you got a, um, anyone, anyone have any? A, again, sorry. <laughs> just, just leave them with a the microphone so that they'll have a bit of a chat with, between themselves for a bit. Well, uh, just a, a word about cut and rolling and stuff. Uh, you told it's fine if, you're, if we're not blocking you, not making it harder to make uh, stable release, but mm -hmm. Let's say that uh, I, I tell everybody that uh, testing is usable and that they should use it. Would that make your job harder or not? Um, well, we always want more people to use testing. Um, it's, it's a bit hard to, to answer that with a yes or no question. Um, people finding bugs in testing is, is useful um, because we want a, a good stable release. It, um, we, we're not going to guarantee, though, that testing will always remain um, unbroken for all packages. Um, because there are, as I've um, shown, there are reasons that sometimes we just need to break it. There are no other ways of getting these packages migrated with our current tools. Um, but that said, we can't try and keep it as usable as we can. And then when we do break it, we always make sure we clean that up afterwards and we treat it um, very carefully. Uh, second question on this topic. Uh, I saw the effort you're making to keep it uh, usable. I mean, uh, breaking it on K3BSD is fine. I mean, wh wh when I... Well, I, I, I think K3BSD well, users might not agree with that, but... Well, temporary, I mean, uh, people who are using K3BSD currently uh, use seed anyway, so... Uh, either stable or seed, I don't think there are many uh, desktop users who really need uh, testing because they're not clueful enough to, to fix stuff, so... I mean, I mean, when, when we're lo looking at uh, keeping testing usable, at least for the rolling idea, is really for the main stream of people, that is uh, mainly i386 and IMD64. And, yeah. uh, well, my, my question was <laughs> just, uh, would you mind if we decided to add a rolling symlink to testing just to be able to use this marketing effect uh, to say testing is not broken, so we can call it rolling. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm not sure that creating a new suite and, and everything around it is perhaps the best way of getting a marketing effect to try and say, you can use testing. Um, I personally don't particularly care what it's called. Um, I, I'm not, I, I don't really mind. Um, I, I like publicity people to see, see, think if it's particularly better if it's called rolling or testing or whatever we do. Um, the problem with potentially calling it rolling is, is what happens in freeze time. Does it stop rolling? Um, uh, and so, the, the, so I think testing is certainly a, is, is a useful description to, for what it is. Um, we have run out of time, but thank you very much for everyone. Um, and if anyone has any questions, then certainly myself and Adam or any of the release team, I'm sure, would be very happy to help answer those. Thank you very much, everyone.